Alert, alert, alert! Lee Sullivan detected! Welcome to BritCon 2021. My name is Steve Caldwell. I'm the General Manager of Brit Events Northwest, a partner organisation of BritCon in the Pacific Northwest region. And I'm happy today to uh, be host uh, to an interview with one of my fellow Brits, um, Lee Sullivan, who's uh, going to tell us a little bit about himself. Um, so welcome to uh, BritCon, Lee. Well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I am a comic strip artist who um, has blundered into the worlds of, uh, of, of many interesting TV franchises and Doctor Who and uh, Jerry Anderson and uh, Robocop and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, I've got a lot to say and so little time to say it. Well, we'll we'll try and squeeze as much as we can into the time we got available. Um, so let's sort of go back to the beginning, not literally to your birth, but um, maybe uh, in terms of what would you say uh, were your biggest influences in getting involved in uh, comic strips originally? Well, I guess it was kind of... Um... It was almost inevitable because one of the things I did as a as a young child was I drew, and I drew and I drew and I drew. So um, on wallpaper, you know, receipts, anything my mum and dad had to hand uh, was something that I would I would just be drawing, and what I would be drawing would would be uh, the things mainly that I saw on TV and in books, uh, the, the the kind of things that I had access to. Uh, and that would be, you know, um, uh, primarily kids' shows, and one of which was, uh, which we'll probably come to at some point, was a lot of Jerry Anderson stuff at the time. Uh, when I was about four or five, those series were start the Super Mario Nation series were starting to air on TV in England, where I'm based. Uh, and um, and Doctor Who started in 63 too when I was five years old. So uh, you can all do the maths now, kids. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I'm, uh, I was, I, so I, really I have lots and lots of books which have got drawings of mine of things like Fireball XL5 and the TARDIS and, uh, and, and Daleks and all that, all kinds of stuff, Cybermen. Uh, there are things on the internet you can find of mine from a very early age, so... Uh, happy hunting right um so w what got you then into the actual business of comics well uh it's one of those overnight things that took about nearly 30 years um i was uh because i uh, my my mother had a clear idea that people could work in commercial art area uh, so I would be I, I knew there was a thing called a commercial artist so right from a very early age I thought well I'll be a commercial artist because that's what I do best and I'm not much good at anything else <laughs> and it, it doesn't stretch me academically which is a, a good thing uh, and um, and I went to college I went through my uh, schooling doing art and then I went to college uh, what they have here a further educational system which meant that I uh, trained in, I did a foundation course in art generally, and then specifically illustration for three years, drawing um, cutaways of cars and also wildlife, a very interesting mix of things. Um, but that then I went to work um, at a an aerospace industry uh, doing graphics and all sorts of stuff. And I kind of forgot about comics because comics, although they were a big part of my childhood, um, uh, reading comics was, and, and I used to draw lots of comics, uh, not for publication. Uh, and, um, but I kind of forgot about that because I got into the, the real world of earning money and it was mostly advertising and industry. And then I kind of blundered into knowing um a guy who lived in my what is now the village i live in his name was john higgins uh and he was the colorist on watchman uh which was the huge successful comics uh um, well the, the 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 comic that came and changed everything about comics written by alan moore drawn by dave gibbons colored by 
um, John Higgins. And John was a lovely guy, and he um, he took me under his wing a bit, took me into Marvel UK, which was a a well, the UK's branch of Marvel Comics, but a, a very small, um, they wouldn't mind me saying, small but perfectly formed uh, a version of Marvel. Uh, they would re, they would they would repackage Marvel US stuff, but they also were um, interleaving, in particular, Transformers stories. Uh, with the US stories, they would be released, the UK ones would be released on a weekly basis. So the material from a monthly comic uh, from Transformers US was w quickly ran out. So they bolstered it with uh, UK artwork. And I became one of the artists on that, um, working with Simon Furman and Richard Starkings, who was quite influential in my whole career. He's moved me on from one thing to another using his secret ways. Uh, right. And um, that's how I got into comics, really, I, it, uh, completely by accident. But I was very happy to be there um, uh, by default, really. Right. And um, I believe we've got a, uh, an example from Transformers UK. Um, we can show people what you were involved in, as you hinted at. Um, and was that the first work that you really got involved with? Yeah, uh, Transformers was the very first uh, comic strip art that I drew. This, in fact, this is in fact the very first Transformer that I uh, drew at all. I had no idea what they were about because I was about twenty-eight by this stage, and uh, the whole kids' uh, uh, obsession with Transformers was at its peak then. But I knew nothing about it, so I came to this. <laughs> really blind uh, i didn't realize how big they were it was a bit of a shock uh, they're, they're all you know well over 30 foot tall um but i didn't really get the idea of it but on the other hand i knew that there was this fantastic following amongst the kids and it's 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 proved to be the case that although it wasn't something that i particularly was interested in they were really interested in them and i've become you know well known in this um in this particular uh, genre um and and i loved them really because they were you could do things like this page in particular this is the death of galvatron who was a major character in the later um series and uh i got to destroy him in this time vortex <laughs> here uh, uh and really pulled his face I, I i actually you can see there there's in the top right corner there there's uh his eyeballs actually flying out will you you couldn't really do that with a kid's comic um, mm. uh, with featuring real people. <laughs> but with Transformers, right. <laughs> we could dismember them happily. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds you took great glee in that, Lee. Yeah, I, well, there is an element of... Um, I, there's always an element of trying to pull pull the wool over the publisher's eyes mm -hmm. or, or uh, get get one get things past the... the the censors to the kids because the kids kids are generally i remember being this way myself tremendously bloodthirsty we had a wonderful series of american trading cards here uh called uh, the american civil war cards and they featured very gruesome ends to people uh pictured in loving color uh, which you would which you'd regard while you were chewing your bubble gum uh and uh, and uh, you know the kids love blood gore and, and mayhem you, you, you may have noticed with uh, with uh, with some you've met yourself uh, and um so we were always trying to do things like that get things past the the the, the censorship and it's a lot of it's self censorship really but with robots you could go to town but transformers had a, a really wonderful effect on uh, my career because one of the episodes that uh, that I drew featured uh, a guy called Richard Branson, who you may have heard <laughs> of. Um, and he was, uh, back then, he was a shy retiring uh, uh, record mobile, mobile uh, mogul, I should say. Uh, and he was just had this burgeoning um, Virgin Atlantic thing starting to happen. And um, he took part in a campaign 
it was it, it didn't really go anywhere but it was a revival of a campaign from the 1960s called uh keep britain tidy and uh and <laughs> the storyline was these transformers have been hauled out of the thames locked in a rusty embrace and on the key side was richard branson who was cleaning the thames up uh <laughs> and um there's a wonderful line in it which uh which again got past everybody i think which <laughs> the, the the coupling of the words richard branson shark uh, was tremendously funny to us for some reason. Um, <laughs> but I drew a likeness of Richard Branson. He was supposed to be a Branson-like figure, but I, being literally minded in the rough, I actually drew Richard Branson. Um, the guys all thought this was a hoot. And, um, and so they said, oh, OK, just draw him as Richard Branson in that case. We'll call him Richard Branson if we can get away with it. So they, they actually contacted his office and uh, and he approved being used in this Transformers comic because again, as I say, he's shy, retiring, didn't yes, want yes. publicity really to be sp to speak of. Um, and but that was really a crucial moment for me because it showed I could draw likenesses, which is apparently not given to everyone. Um, I just assumed it; everyone could do that uh, in the comics field. But but. Simon and Richard, uh, Richard Starkings particularly noticed that and said, well, maybe you'd be good in Doctor Who, uh, right. which was something I had always wanted to do and never thought I'd ever get a shot at doing. And I catapulted from drawing Transformers, my first comic strips in Transformers, my first, Richard Branson was the first human I drew in comic strip form. And then the next comic strip, that I got to do was all seven at that time of the of the doctors, um, uh, so about about half of this picture, um, and uh, and a whole load of their companions because I could do likenesses that got me into doing a doctor right. in, in a quite a high profile story. It was the twenty fifth anniversary um, special where all the doctors got together, or supposedly. Um, and so my career suddenly kicked off in a way that it might not have done without Richard Branson, um, as unlikely as that may seem. And, and yes, this is a this is a later iteration, much later on. Uh, I, I I've done Doctor Who comics now for on and off um, since 1989 or thereabouts. Um, and uh, this was a later one when Peter Capaldi took over as Doctor. Titan Comics had the, or no, this is I. This might actually be IDW. I forget now because there's so many. There are so many comics now of Doctor Who in comparison when I started on Doctor Who magazine. Um, but uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful ride because I was a big Doctor Who fan. It was my, along with the Jerry Anderson stuff, it was my absolute favourite program. Right, <clears throat> and the um, th this was all taking place, um, I understand, during what are called the Wilderness Years. Um, as well, far the as Wilderness Doctor Years, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're the, yes, ex you're actually right. I came in and basically closed down the, the programme. Uh, <laughs> it's, like, it's like that vodka, the effect is shattering. Um, <laughs> yeah, I came in just as the TV series was in its final year of... Uh, of uh, the original TV series under with Sylvester McCoy, John Nathan Turner, Andrew Cartmel, all those people, uh, the lovely Sophie Aldred. I went to conventions. It was it was a real kind of family kind of thing. Um, and th then the BBC canned it, which which seemed like a disaster at the time because I just got into it. I came in, you know, I came, I saw, it conked out. Uh, <laughs> that's an old Mad Magazine joke, uh, um, and. Uh, I, we thought that was terrible, but actually the wilderness years where there was a very long gap where Doctor Who wasn't actually broadcast or, or made um, was actually extremely good for comic strip artists because it, it the comic strip became really for a while the only new Doctor Who that was available um, for some years. Virgin uh, then launched a book series which started to continue the adventures Doctor Who magazine carried on doing its thing um, uh, with comic strips. Occasionally I would do them. But because of that, the comic strips got a very high profile, really, with fans because it was the new stuff they could indulge themselves in. We did a story of, with Daleks, which 
well, my favourite. Um, you may notice uh, where are we here? Some mm. of uh, some of those guys are hanging around in the background. Um, Daleks were my favourite thing uh, forever, really, and um, I got to draw them, and um, that became a very popular story. And then, and it, and it continued for some time until the TV movie, which is what we're looking at now. Um, the TV movie came along and revived it briefly for one episode only. Um, with Paul McGann as the Doctor, and I got to, because I'd worked with Gary Russell, who's a, a great uh, guy, and uh, we were friends on the Doctor Who magazine day, from the Doctor Who magazine days, um, suggested me as the artist when it came back. Uh, in fact, we ran much longer than the series did. We did a year's mm -hmm. worth, nearly a year's worth of comic strip in the biggest listings magazine, TV listings magazine in England called Radio Times. Um, and it had a, I think it had a readership of maybe three or four million at the time. So it was quite a, a prestigious thing to do. Um, but again, the series failed to materialise and then there's a whole gap and then other comics, uh, you know, Doctor Who magazine uh, carried on and then other IDW and Titan books uh, have been continuing the series ever since. But it's never had the same um, kind of... Uh, profile that it had at just that time right. because the series was off right and um subsequently um when the series returned um you continued on with the comic strips and is, is that when you started uh, your webcast illustrations Oh yeah, actually, that was still during the wilderness years really that the, the, i <laughs> I tend to forget them because they were um they don't have so much of an outlet now, but there were, for a while, it was the official uh, BBC contribution to Doctor Who were the webcasts. Um, the idea was there was one in particular called Death Comes to Time. Uh, Dan Freeman uh, was the um, was the guy who was sort of the Doctor Who producer at the time. Uh, he was producing an audio adventure um, called Death Comes to Time. Where he killed the Doctor off, which was an interesting choice, but um, but he was uh, he's that kind of guy. He's always right on the edge um, of mayhem. Uh, and um, but the BBC thought that it would be a great thing if they could augment this thing with images. So they did something called a webcast, which was basically do very basic animation. Uh, using drawings, and my drawings were the ones that were used. Um, so they accompanied the audio, uh, and in a way, it's the very, very early prototype of those lovely um, animations that are being brought out now on DVD and Blu-ray uh, of the missing adventures. But we had, we had far, we had an even smaller budget than they have, so it was, um, it was an interesting uh, thing. But we did four of those. Um, and uh, and that again kept the whole Doctor Who thing going when there was nothing, mm. there were no programs to to back it up. Right. Um, now I have a, a fan question for you. Oh, good. Um, is, is there? You do have at least one fan anyway, Lee. Nice to uh, meet you. <laughs> is there a <laughs> is there a particular era of the Doctor you prefer illustrating, and if so, why? Well, I think a lot of it's an emotional bond, really. I mean, I've got three answers to this, but I'll try and make them quick. Um, obviously, Sylvester McCoy's time uh, was the one that kicked my, my career off. So I'm indebted to his doctor. Uh, I had a great time uh, several times meeting up with Sylvester and particularly Sophie. We got on very well at conventions. Um, and so, you know, we've 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 knocked around a bit since, and that's that's been great. Uh, and later on, I got to work with um, Ben Aronovich and Andrew Cartmel. We'll come to that later. Um, uh, from that period, so that's a very important period for me. Uh, from a from a uh, a viewer's perspective, my favourite period. I suppose still has to be the first three doctors, in particular William Hartnell, um, because the magic of it then was so intense to me and it was so real. 
as a five-year-old seeing a, the Dalek interior blobby claw coming out from underneath a, a thal cloak. This is this is specific stuff, kids. Um, uh, in the first Dalek story, really made a huge impact on me, and the Daleks in particular did, and I just believed it all. It was it was fantastic. As in terms of drawing uh, a comic strip, because I've drawn most of them, um, actually Patrick Troughton, because Troughton is the mo my my favourite performance of the Doctor is is Troughton's because he's so mercurial and and light and interesting and then dark as mm. a sort of an undercurrent it's interesting to try and get him uh i've done two comic strips featuring his doctor or maybe three or four but primarily two and they i really enjoyed trying to do his body uh language the fact he's always got sleeves that are slightly too long for his arms right. Well, his um his son describes his his dad's hands as spades, like spades, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, there, I love I love that period very much, uh, and um and so it was a real treat to get to draw those. Right, and, and um, does that mean that your your favourite wardrobe um of the doctors is the Patrick Troughton one or? Are there others that you enjoy drawing? Well, obviously, in my private life, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always wearing very baggy uh, check trousers. And, uh, right, and right. Frock coat. Now, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I liked, uh, yeah, his, his costume. It's, it's really interesting that, that I hadn't realised that the books, the novelizations came along and kind of rewrote history slightly. The, the, there's a scene, I think, probably Terence Dix wrote it, which was in one of the novels which of the um, of the uh, stories. Um, had him, Troughton, the second Doctor, is has just regenerated and he hunts through uh, a chest to find some clothes. But that didn't happen in the, in the show. Mm. His his clothes actually regenerated with him, so he starts right. off, you know, as Hartnell with his nice, very, very elegant Edwardian kind of check uh, trousers and and just so frock coat, and a and a nice uh, uh, ribbon tie, <laughs> and Troughton suddenly regenerates, and his trousers have become huge, baggy, and very loud <laughs> check, and is coat right. is now huge and clown like really and then he finds a, a stovepipe hat but and, and the, the the ribbon tie has become this bow tie which is stuck on with a safety pin that all <laughs> happens in the regeneration it's quite an interesting right. thing right fans um, got extremely annoyed later on when peter davison's boots uh, changed between tom baker and uh and peter davison's <laughs> but i thought they don't know they, they've lived these fans we had whole costume changes <laughs> Clearly, your attention to detail is much better than mine. Um, it's, uh, it's frightening. Yeah, um, so, uh, we have, a, I believe, a, uh, an image of Absalom Dak, um, oh, yeah. which turned up in a TV episode. And uh, perhaps you can give us a bit of background to that. Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting thing. I came home from uh, I, I I was playing a gig one night, and I came home to find a whole load of messages saying, "Your Absalom Dark is in Doctor Who, uh, the program. It's going to be in there next week because it was the the it also featured in the preview for the next episode." Um, and I just thought, "What the hell are they talking about? How's how's that happened?" And what has happened is that in the um, I oh my god yeah I can't remember the I think it might be called the vault something like that the the, the episode is about a heist oh it's a heist uh, and um and uh, there's a bank vault which is broken into and this guy on the left here is actually pr plugged into a, a computer and shows various ne'er do wells uh, and their prison uh, kind of numbers and so on um, uh, as as prospective candidates uh, to rob this vault. And um, they, as a joke, the production company obviously just took a picture of Absalom Dark, who was a fan favourite comic strip character created by um, 
Stephen Moore and uh, Steve Dillon uh, back in the 1970s and in a backup strip uh, as a Dalek. He was a Dalek killer. Uh, and we revived him, Richard Starkings, uh, John Freeman and I, uh, John Tomlinson all, all revived him for um, a strip we did in the uh, in the early 80s, uh, late 80s, I should say, early 90s. Um, and that's a frame from one of the comics that I drew, which suddenly found its way in, you know, 20 years later or something into the TV program. It, I, I, it's got to be one of the few times that a comic strip artist's work has ended up back in the thing that that it, it was basically right. alluding to in the first place. A tremendous, right. um, tremendous, tremendously pleasurable thing to have happen. And that, um, you've already um, uh, dropped a name in earlier in the conversation, um, but also you've done a lot of work. Um, on something I know you're very much a fan of, which is uh, Jerry Anderson. And um, I wonder whether you would like to talk to us a little bit about um, what what sort of strips you've been involved in with that and um, what were the challenges for you in drawing the various illustrations? Well, um one of the, the great things about the 1960s was uh, the, the TV 21 comic, which we, we talk about in another interview, but um, it, was a, it was a wonderful publication that tied together an awful lot of the Jerry Anderson series. Uh, it had comic strips um, uh, which continued the adventures, because back in those days you watched an episode a week, and then when, it, when they ran out of episodes after... 20 episodes or something that was it it's gone and you're on to the next thing but the comics kept you tied back into the world of anderson uh which now become known as the anderverse uh, and that's um that that was a very important thing so i read those and I absorbed those uh while i was doing my own scribbling uh I was really looking at those guys and thinking how wonderful this is. Um, and then much, much later on, uh, once I'd become a comic strip artist, Do uh, Thunderbirds did one of its periodical uh, revivals uh, in the UK. Uh, and uh, the publishing company I'd worked for basically had, who had been Marvel UK, um, then had the rights to do the Thunderbirds comic. And then I drew that, a strip in there for five years the, my my sadness is that it was never done in the same manner as the tv21 strips which had brilliant um artists working on them top line artists doing fully um it's difficult to describe kind of proper adult comic illustration versions of the characters. Um, this was aimed at a much younger audience, which is ironic really, but it was it was aimed at a younger audience. It had to be much more simplified, uh, much more direct. Um, there were still people who'd been involved in TV21 who were actually behind it. I think uh, Fennel was producing some of those stories. It was, uh, it was lovely to do and I enjoyed it very much. Um, but it never really had the kind of adult look that I would have liked to have given it. Um, nevertheless, it was it was it was a, a thing to have done, and and I I had learned very early on that just because your audience is young doesn't mean they'll really really get it. And I have right. met subsequently people who, although I'm not particularly proud of the work I did, uh, were thrilled by it. So you know you you have to kind of accept that and think okay i've come to terms with it now but later on i got to do um covers of re for reprints of the original tv 21 strips uh, that they've been um uh, uh, compiled in various uh, things and i've done various uh, cover illustrations for those um which kind of tie me slightly with those gods from the past um so i stand on the shoulders of giants you know but one in particular which was very nice was working with mike noble because he was a comic strip artist on captain scarlet and fireball xl5 notably uh, back then uh and also space 1999 later um he was uh my particular hero from the 1960s uh and he uh, amazingly 
I got to know him. Uh, a friend of mine, mm. a mutual friend, introduced us. I he <laughs> we then sat and really talked for hours about his work on Thunder on uh, on Fireworks L Five, um, and we eventually actually got to do some work together. Uh, this is actually that's interesting. This one is uh, in, done in the style of Mike Noble. I, I set myself a challenge to do a, a, a drawing of Fireball XL5, um, but using his techniques uh, and the stylization that he had of line and airbrush art, and also painted artwork, uh, hand painted work. Um, and this subsequently led to um, these kind of box artworks, some of which you can see behind me when we cut back to the uh, um, the the live image. Um, these are all subsequent um, illustrations that I've done based on the fact that I've become known as a Jerry Anderson artist, uh, but in no small mm. part because I got, I kind of hooked myself on Mike Noble's coattails. We did a, a print together and he was very interested in how digital work happened and I work primarily digitally these days. In right. The, you know, the box art works here and here right. are the figures. There we go. There are the figures that come yep. in the boxes. Double right. family there, art and 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 toy at the same time. Um, uh, so the whole experience of of working on the Anderson stuff was great, and working with Mike was fantastic. And sadly, he's no longer with us. But um, we had you know a nice friendship for six years, and we worked on three illustrations for publication. Um, uh, Various sort of box artworks. Uh, the, in fact, Captain Scarlet, which is just there, uh, right. uh, is based on his drawing of Captain Scarlet. I got him to do a pencil work, even though he wasn't really up to doing a full illustration anymore at that stage. Um, you know, the, I got him the gig, and and I was very 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 pleased mm. to do the the artwork to work on his pencils again, right. standing on right. the shoulders of giants. Yeah. But then subsequently, I've got to know Jamie Anderson, who is now right. head of, uh, uh, who's uh, Jerry's uh, youngest son, and um, he now runs Anderson Entertainment, and we've been involved in all sorts of uh, adventures since. Right, and uh, uh, what are some of those adventures in included? Well, of course, I can't tell you anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sad bit about it. No, uh, along with Chris... Uh, uh, Thompson, who uh, we were, we, we share a, an interview with you uh, later on or before this. Um, uh, we both worked on Firestorm, which is one of Jerry's legacy programs, um, which um, has had a slow gestation, but it's going to happen eventually. But I provided lots of um, concept art for that. So it was beautiful going into a you know, basically it, coming down to work in the morning and designing some spaceships and uh, mm. and some backgrounds and some characters and all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's been really interesting. It's gone through many different changes since it was initially launched, but um, it will come to fruition at a future date. Also been working with, an, with him on another series, TV series, um, uh, which uh, again I can't really say anything about, but that should be materialising in the course of getting somewhere in the course of this year. So right. uh, it's been really interesting. Jamie's a lovely guy, and um, it's funny because I'm old enough for, for <laughs> to have been one of his poster boys. Uh, I, I, strictly speaking, my artwork. Obviously, um, mm. I did a. I did a um, poster of Daleks and Cybermen, which was released in Doctor Who magazine years ago. And Jamie, being a big fan of Doctor Who, ironically, um, had that on his wall for a while. So when we first met, I was able to say, I really admired your dad's work. And he you know, was able to return the compliment. And we, we've become firm friends since. And it's been really good fun working, not just on on potential TV series, but I'm doing a lot of spin-off things. Um, there are some illustrations I've been doing this year uh, based around Thunderbirds and Space 1999, and there will be Supercar and Fireball illustrations to come. So, um... mm. Good. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to um, Rivers of London, and I think we've got a, an illustration of that. Um, and I have a fan question on that. Your second fan. We've got up to two now. 
Um, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Slowly um, but surely. It, <laughs> yeah. Um, how was it, was it working with uh, Ben Aronovich and Andrew Cartmel on the uh, Rivers of London novels? Well, it was great. As, as many of you will know, Doctor Who fans from that uh, Sylvester McCoy era, uh, uh, ben wrote uh, a couple of TV stories, Battlefield and uh, and um, Remembrance of the Daleks. Uh, and so I was a big fan of his stuff. Uh, he wrote a really good novelization of Remembrance of the Daleks, which was top notch. Um, that was before I met them. Andrew, I never met at the time the show was on, but we nearly got to work together on a Marvel UK project, uh, which was going to be called The Two Doctors. Um, mm. and, uh, but it was going to be Dr. Seven and Dr. Strange. And the mm. idea was that the world of science and, uh, and, uh, the supernatural would, and magic would clash. Um, and it's a great story that never got told. It's a, sh mm. a terrible shame. We both regret it, but it, it just, it was nixed by Marvel U US. They didn't like, they couldn't see any mileage in it for Doctor Strange, I think, because back then Doctor Who was nothing really, as far as the yeah. United States was concerned. Uh, and fair enough. So that was, uh, that was canned. But um, we subsequently uh, met a bit, I think, at conventions, but finally getting to work with both of them on Rivers of London was, was terrific fun because they're both, uh, they're both really good guys. And um, we had a lot of fun working on that, particularly having lunches together, um, <laughs> uh, which I hope will start up again soon. Um, because, but this was a really great opportunity for me because it was creating a whole world, although the, the literary world, these are based on a series of novels, which Ben wrote and, uh, Ben and Andrew, um, script the comics, uh, series, which are not the novels, but they add to the novels, uh, and they are canonical. So that's quite an interesting situation normally like with doctor who nothing you do in the comic strip will affect the program in any way at all mm. uh, but in this instance a lot of the stories and visualizations of things in the comics have actually gone back into the novels they've it, mm. it's been working in tandem ben blends them one with the other he doesn't regard there any as being any separation between the two it's it's all his world of rivers london which is by the way a supernatural uh, police uh, uh, procedural kind of show uh, um, uh, 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 series <laughs> it should be a show they keep trying to it keeps being up um but uh it was really good work good working with them too R really really interesting people very lively minds um which makes up for my rather dullard uh intellect but i can i can do pretty pictures oh <laughs> yes okay. that's right that's what you're here for um yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh i also understand you had some involvement in uh william shatner's uh, tech world um comic series and even got to meet um mr shatner himself yeah that was uh that is one of those career highlights which you just can't really believe happening this is when i back when i had hair folks I, <laughs> I had so much hair i had a ponytail which you can't see there um uh but there you go um that was back in the 1990s uh it, it i've always been a big star trek fan and i've always been a big kirk fan which makes me a big shatner fan um and it, the, the idea that I was, I got to work on this series because another guy dropped out. I mean, it's just one of those things that happens uh, and they needed a, a replacement quick. And I was the only person they could find. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I got, uh, again, I think Richard played a small part in that and also, uh, or pro probably quite a big part, Richard Starkings, but um, uh, the Marvel US team, uh, it, it, I'd worked on Robocop prior to this. And so I'd got my, my chops in uh, working on the US uh, monthly series. Uh, and um, uh, Tech World came along based on a series of novels, again, by, by um, William Shatner and Ron Goulart. Uh, and I was very pleased to be working for Captain Kirk. And, it, and it, I would lie in my bath at the end of the evening of slaving away over, over comic strip pages thinking, 
well it's hard work and you know there's a, it's very intense pressurized work working on comics i find um but I would giggle with the idea that William Shatner would be looking at these pages and, and, <laughs> and presumably vetting them. But I just thought that's that's as far as it will go. And then one day I went to the shops. Uh, this could be a very long story, but I'll keep it very short. Um, I went to the shops, came back, and uh, there was a message on my answer machine, which was in those days a tape machine, uh, and, it, and it was a message from William Shatner, and, and it went along the lines of, Hi, oh. hey. I really wanted to talk to you about <laughs> the comic book series. I wonder if you are this. You know, stuff like that. Uh, uh, I, I don't do him justice, obviously. But um, I was stuck. He said, I'm moving on now. I'll call you soon. Now, <laughs> I then sat by my drawing board for the next three weeks <laughs> while nothing happened. Uh, and eventually we needed more stuff from the shops. So I went out to the shops, uh, came back and there's another answer machine uh, message on the same tape, uh, which is Lee, I missed you again. Uh, and uh, so uh, he said, I just want to talk to you about this stuff. There's changes that we're making and we want to do this stuff, you know? Uh, and um, so I, uh, I said, I thought, this is ridiculous. I cannot keep missing being out to <laughs> William Shatner. That's ridiculous. So I managed, within about half an hour, I managed to get his phone number. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure how that happened. But I I, I just bludgeoned my way through international um, uh, uh, restrictions and got his phone number. And then he was on the phone line talking to me. And we had a lovely chat. He told me all about the TV series that he was making of, of Tech World at the time. He wanted to combine that into the, the comic strip. Um, and then he said, he made the mistake of saying, so if you're ever passing, uh, well, <laughs> passing was Toronto, where it was being made. Um, that's not just round the corner from Dunstable, I can tell right. you. Uh, and so, um, uh, but of course, you know, if someone says that to you. I jumped on a plane as soon as possible, went with the current writer of the strips, uh, Evan Skolnick at the time. And we had, I don't know, three or four days on set uh, watching him direct and star in uh, the, the TV movie and hang out with him. And all this wow. crew, uh, um, not the Enterprise crew, obviously, mm -hmm. and that would be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but I got to sit in the back of a, of a what was then, a, 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 I suppose, the forerunner of the SUVs, a sort of people carrier, they were called here. And it kind of looked vaguely shuttlecraft-ish. Um, and I sat in the back and, I, and he was taking the mickey out of my British accent, going, four, 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 four. <laughs> and I was... I didn't say anything, but I thought, you, you're taking the mickey out of my voice. <laughs> uh, but I turned around, and it's Captain Kirk, you know. That that profile is just, it's Kirk. And right. it was a marvellous time. He was really nice. We exchanged Christmas cards for ages, and it was all very nice and lovely. Very. Um, uh, so moving on from... Uh, your new celebrity status, um, oh, yes. being a pal of William Shatner. Um, tell us a bit about your commissioned work uh, that you do. And I think we've got some examples of that. Yeah, um, well, it's a sort of, it's something I've always done, really. Uh, even back to uh, when I worked for British Aerospace, people would always be leaving uh, to go on to Pastures New and or retiring. And so I would do cartoons of people in various uh, exciting environments, um, which would be things like sitting watching football on TV. <laughs> and uh, uh, But it, you would place someone in an interesting uh, cartoon situation. And, I, and I've carried on doing that as part of, part of my side work away from comics. People will sometimes commission me to do illustrations which will... Um, uh, um, oh, excuse me, I'm getting a low battery warning. That's a terrible thing. Um, uh, so we'll have to be quick. Uh, but uh, yeah, something like that. So um, you would uh, place someone in the TARDIS and have an oud in the background. Um, and uh, they would often be supplied as birthday presents to people. And I still do that, um, as well as doing uh, 
comics uh, sketches when when there are conventions when they come back which i think they will probably by the end of next year uh, we'll right. be doing lots of drawings for people as sketches at conventions and it's something that artists generally end up doing as a nice supplement to one's major income income right and, and touring commissions i understand that you have a limited edition print that is only available through brickcon oh indeed uh, um yeah and, uh, if you'd like to tell print. us a bit more about that that'd be great Okay, uh, well, I was asked many years, it seems like a lifetime ago now, because um, BritCon, as you know, uh, kind of, uh, although the conventions didn't happen for a while, uh, but anyway, this illustration did, and uh, it shows, obviously, Seattle's finest. Um, uh, I, I, it's a lovely image, that. Um, but with the TARDIS hanging, uh, being trapped by a whole bunch of Daleks on their flying hoverbout machines, uh, and also the Starbug, uh, almost unaccountably uh, blundering into the whole scene, which is very uh, Red Dwarf, I think. Uh, but yeah, we have uh, we did a, a, a signed and limited edition print uh, available uh, um, at an uh, address yeah. that will probably pop up at some yeah, stage. Yeah, no, well, I, I, I'll actually give that address um, in, a, in a moment because uh, it was a twelve by seventeen. Um, yeah. I believe, and uh, approximate and, uh, sizes only. Uh, yeah. Other sizes are of it. No, it's 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 a, it's about that size. It's a right. um, uh, it's a limited edition of uh, fifty, right? And each one of them is signed by me, right? Uh, and so uh, people can find it by going to brickcon.org. Um, I'm looking under the store tab, um, and look for the Lee Sullivan print, yeah. and. Um, Lee will enjoy his scenic show winging its way to you. Yes, every home um, should have one. Most of the stuff that you're now working on or working on in the future is pretty top secret. Is there, is there anything you can let us know about? Uh, no, well, it's, it is so annoying, this, because it's been, all of it has been, what, to one degree or another, under wraps for most of the time I've been working on it. But yes, Firestorm is there. There's another um series which is uh anderson entertainment which hopefully will be seeing the light of day very soon um again i've been concept arting on those and producing illustrations for the publicity and so on for that um i've been working on a number of things uh, for jamie which are uh, sort of mixed media outlets but there'll be images from um thunderbirds supercar fireball uh, space 1999 um and i'm, I'm currently oddly i'm working on a on a uh, as a sort of strange connection i'm working on a series of comic strips for the for a company which is involved uh with cycling and um and one of the major sporting events which i can't talk about either <laughs> Right. <laughs> this is the least informative interview you'll ever hear. There's lots of other things I can't tell you about as well. Um, yeah, well it's, yeah, it's, I, a good, I, it's a good job I don't do the Spanish Inquisition because then you would have to tell me. Well, it, with any luck, my battery would give out halfway through, just as I was about to say, I'm working on. <laughs> yeah. and it was um, so, <laughs> where, where on the interweb can uh, people find your work? Okay, uh, well, my website, you can Google me. I'm pretty easy to find. If you put Lee Sullivan Art into Google, you'll find me pretty quickly. There's lots and lots of images, and some of it will point to my website, which is Lee Sullivan Art, so L-E-E-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N-A-R-T dot co dot UK, uh, and that will find its way to uh, my website. Um and uh, there is, there's tons of stuff on there to look at. And I ramble on, as you can imagine, at some length about almost all of it. Um, and, uh, and that's a good starting point for me. Right. Well, that'll, that'll be an extra time chore for people once the, this interview is finished. Um, like now, we, <laughs> now, we can't finish without talking about uh, music. And I believe you play an instrument. And we want to get that oh. in before you before your battery runs out. Yeah. Okay. Well, I play one of these, uh, a saxophone, uh, and uh, I have played it on and off in um, in bands uh, for the last oh, I don't know, twenty 
20 years or so, I suppose. But primarily, I'm a saxophonist because of Roxy Music, which is a fantastic art rock band uh, from the 1970s and 80s. And somewhere here is a cover I did for two of members of Roxy Music uh, last year, or the year before, I think. Um, my hero is Andy Mackay, who's a saxophonist in Roxy Music. And it's led to me being in a tribute band for Roxy Music for 10 years. And now I, I riff right. along to various bands uh, in local uh, outlets. Right. So you're not going to do a rendition of Love is the Drug for us? Oh, well, I suppose I could do something. <laughs> Well, there we are. I won't do another note. <laughs> well, on that note, um, <laughs> it's, time, it's time to wrap things up. Um, I'd just like to thank you so much, uh, Lee, for joining us today all the way across the pond. And uh, we wish you well with all your rest of your career. And um, we hope that all 50 of the, um, the uh, prints get sold. It's my fervent wish too. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking and uh, I, I have a good convention virtually. That was great, wasn't it? I'm the doctor and you are watching BrickCon. Don't go away.